Welcome to Beyond Boundaries, a series of virtual sessions initiated by Takshila Educational Society to further ideas that foster learning, self-expression, and ingenuity. In order to facilitate better understanding of our world and its concerns, we bring articulate speakers from all walks of life on this platform to propagate diverse themes, thoughts, and perspectives. In today's session titled, My Adventures in Authorland, our speaker, Rupa Pai, takes us through her fascinating authorly journey of over 25 years, sharing the many life lessons she has picked up along the way. Rupa Pai is an acclaimed author, journalist, computer engineer, and heritage enthusiast. She has written over 25 fiction and nonfiction books for young readers, including the eight-part Taranaut series, The Gita for Children, and Ready, 99 Must Have Skills for the World Conquering Teenager, and Almost Teenager. In addition, she has co-authored Milan Soman's memoir, Made in India, and is translating Padmashri K.S. Nisar Emmert's poems from Kannada to English. Rupa is the co-founder and director of Bangalore Walks, which has been offering history and heritage tours across Karnataka for over 14 years. Her TEDx talk, Decoding the Gita, India's Book of Answers, has received over 1.5 million views till date. The speaker would converse for about 30 minutes on the topic. You may submit questions through the chat box of your YouTube channel. All questions from viewers will be answered collectively by the speaker in the last 15 minutes of the session. We begin. Over to our speaker, Rupa Pai. Thank you, Setika, for a very nice introduction. Uh, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. All of you from the Takshila Society and the schools run by Takshila that have gathered here to listen. It's a great honor and a privilege and an entirely, entirely my pleasure to be addressing all of you today. And I am grateful and appreciative of the fact that you have gathered on a Saturday evening when I'm sure you could be doing better things to come and listen to me talking about my adventure. Uh, yeah, so I'll try to make it as worth your while as I can, keep it interesting and engaging and Hopefully, the life lessons that I have learned in my journey as an author will be able to help you in some way as well. So let's go. Mm. I was also a child once and I had my own dreams. And luckily for me, I was one of those lucky, lucky kids who knew exactly what she wanted to be when she grew up, when she was quite young. Uh, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I was, of course, a voracious reader, as can be expected. You know, in fact, I say that uh, one of the main uh, eligibilities to be a writer, if you want to be a writer when you grow up, is that you are a crazy, insane reader. Okay? You have to read a lot to be able to write, uh, at least in my understanding and in my opinion. So, yeah, so I used to read a lot. I was one of those kids who used to go to other people's houses and then immediately kids in that house. I these kids or the house that we visit. So do you need black? You know, before you know, I will and if friends they did not have not sleep very uh, and I might work and Can I come back? Can you hear me? Okay, so she totally lit up my childhood. She taught me how to write. She taught me how to tell a story. She taught me a lot of good values. You know, so I got a lot out of reading Enid Blyton books. Of course, I read a lot of other books as well, but somehow 
these were these formed the bulk of my reading apart from amar chitra katha okay which also i adored and amar chitra katha when i was young was still being produced by the original creator anant pai so we used to wait every month or every fortnight for a new book to release a new amar chitra katha and then it would be a big festival at home like you know we'd all go dress up and go to the bookstore and get the new new amar chitra katha and come back so that was one ritual of my childhood and it was all great fun i loved amar chitra katha i loved vikram and betal stories i loved all the indian mythology <coughs> but none of the indian mythology i read had anything to do with me i mean with with my reality and my life because i was an urban kid growing up the uh, amar chitra katha only spoke about historical figures or mythological figures gods and apsaras very very wonderful very very exciting but nothing like my childhood so i was always looking for kids like me in books that i read and i only read enid blyton books a lot of them and therefore and they seem to be having such fun they were all kids my age but they seem to be having so much for so much more fun than i was in my indian childhood that i began to feel that only british kids have very cool childhoods and my childhood somehow was not so great because the kids in enid blyton books were always unsupervised there were never any adults around the only thing adults were there for was to bring them cookies and juice once in a while and then they would dispense with the adults and the kids would go off and have adventures and go cycling through the countryside and uh, stop for picnics at farms and eat the most gorgeous picnics of i don't know what they used to eat things like ham and tongue and scones none of which i knew i didn't know what they were at all but sitting in south india uh, my picnics seemed very different and definitely not was exciting because our picnic is involved and a bunch of kids and a bunch of aunts that was getting into one or two rest but all of us would be squeezed into one car and then taken to a park which was in my city which we knew very well nothing exciting about it and then once we got there everybody would sort of pour out of the cars and then the aunties would start arranging the food and then the grannies and the kids would be playing playing badminton and you know and the food would always be some boring lemon rice and curd rice and i thought this is not fun man this is not the childhood i was i deserve i deserve better than this and i don't know why my childhood is like this you know and it took a while until i was 13 or something when i was 13 i came across an indian magazine called target and it cherries there were about indian mind and still they seem to be having a lot of fun the way the writers wrote those stories was like i got new perspective i realized that i had lemon rice and curd rice enough to wake up early and prepare this huge feast for me and maybe those kids in enid blyton books who were only eating out of tins and cans were you know i grew up and i began to read and i realized that in england the england had been through two world wars terrible world wars especially the second one and then after that there was it was a period of great austerity or oh, it took a long time to become a rich country again and during that time during the war london was in such danger of being bombed that children would be sent away to boarding school or to the countryside so that they would be safe and their dads would be at the war at the war the mums would be helping out as nurses and any time london could be bombed so they lived in great fear in the countryside thinking i don't even know when school is going to start again like so similar to this but here we know in no danger of bombs falling on our heads or anything happening to our parents today in the coronavirus times but in that time in the war time the children did not know that, that when if when they came back home when they would be allowed to came back come back home when school would start properly and if their parents would still be around they had no idea they'd be sent away to live with some random relative in the country in the villages so that they would be safe and therefore and the food was scarce there wasn't much money so everything was eaten out of tins it wasn't a great life actually but how do you make that life seem like fun for children who are not really enjoying it you write exciting stories like enid blyton did right so then i realized oh my god i've just been taken in by these stories and i have realized that what i am having as an indian child something some very special things for me 
I have taken this for granted. I have not realized how very wonderful this is to be surrounded by not just your parents, but a whole, you know, dynasty or clan of uncles, aunts, grandparents, mama, mommy, the cha 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 chi, everybody who is enjoying themselves and cares for you. And okay, so this is the thing, you know, it depends on perspective. I wish I had read more stories like this when I was growing up and I was younger. But then I began to actively consume Indian stories. I began to look at my own life with a very different lens. And I said, this is actually a good life. And the amount of diversity we have in India, the amount of how fertile the land is, how beautiful it is, how much culture there is, how many handicrafts, how, how much variety, every 200 kilometers, the food changes, the language changes, the dialect changes, the, the way the people look change, the festivals that are celebrated change. This is a great, we never have to leave here. I don't have to go anywhere. You know, I can go and visit other countries, but I will never finishing seeing my, I, I will never finish actually seeing and knowing my own country. And that's when as a writer, even though I was only 13, 14, I thought to myself, you know, I don't want any other Indian children growing up like me thinking that something outside is better or bigger or more desirable. They can think that, but only after they know what their country is about, have understood it and then say, but I prefer that. That's okay. But I was at a stage where I didn't even know what my, I hadn't even thought about what I had. And I was already looking at other things outside and saying, I want that, I want that. And that's when my idea of what kind of writer I wanted to be crystallized. I said, I want to be the kind of writer who writes Indian stories for Indian children. My characters would never be called John and Mary and George or anything like that, which are essentially, you know, that time they used to seem like foreign names. Uh, and now I know enough Johns and Marys and Georges in India as well. But uh, I said it, it would have to be Indian stories. My monsters would not be dragons. My monsters would be Shalabas and Makaras. We have so many bizarre. So that's how Amar Sudra Katha and Enid Blyton came together in my writing. So I would use characters. I thought to myself, I would draw inspiration from the bizarre creatures and characters of our mythology and pair it up with the kind of storytelling skills that Enid Blyton had. And somehow I wanted to tell those kind of stories. So I grew up and I became a children's author. And um, uh, then it, but still it took me a very long time before I wrote my first, I kept writing for children a lot, but my, and, and, and I, I, sh I should, I should not forget to mention this. My, from the very first time I read Target, this became my dream magazine. And as I grew up, to work at Target became my dream job. I wanted to write for Target when I grew up. I wanted to work in Target. I wanted to be part of the team that brought out the magazine. And that became a dream. And my very first job was with Target. I, I wanted it so badly that somehow the universe conspired and made me get that job, even though that job was in Delhi and I was a girl who grew up in Bangalore. And I moved to Delhi just to get that job. And I actually got it. That, and they had such a small team, but I wanted it so bad. And that was my first learning in my, uh, or my adventures in Authorland was that if you want something really, really badly and you're very clear about it and you keep sending that message out to the universe, but that's not enough. You also have to do the work. So what work did I do? I wrote a lot. I, I generated enough of a portfolio. And when the time came for me to get a job, I, I mean, just out of the blue, I wrote to Target. I said, you know, I'm willing to move to Delhi, but if, if you have a job for me. And you know, the strangest thing, Target had a very, very lean uh, uh, editorial team. There were three people in editorial, only three. And those three people usually never quit. People stayed there for, it was a lovely place to work and people never actually quit. But the week I, the, the day my letter, my mail went to them a week previously, one of the three editorial staff had quit. Don't ask me how that happened, but it still gives me goosebumps to think about it. There suddenly, a week before I sent the mail, a place had opened up. And therefore, then they interviewed me. They asked me to send stuff I had written. I already had so much stuff ready, which I had written. I had been publishing stuff in years already as a college student. Because this was, now it was too close. I couldn't let it go. And I got the job. And that was my first learning that if you want something badly enough 
and are prepared to put in the work for it, even if it moves, even if it means moving thousands of kilometers to a to a city that you don't know at all, then the universe will conspire to make it happen for you. Because whatever messages you send out to the universe, the universe hears it. Of course, it should be backed by you should do all the work. But some, if you really want something, it will happen. Like you know, they say, what you seek is seeking you. You know, if you really seek something really badly, that will come seeking you. So that was my first um, uh, learning as an author. My life lesson was: if you want something, go after it. Go after it with passion, dedication. Be willing to sacrifice things. Be willing to come out of your comfort zone, and things will happen in such a way that they will astound you. Okay, so have, keep the faith. Keep the faith. When you have it. Sorry, that was a call. Can you hear me again? Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Sorry. There was a call coming in. So then, then I went off. I did various other things. Finished. I mean, worked for a few years. Then I had back all that. Had kids, right? So then I was sitting around without having much to do. My kids were still very young. Thinking, okay, so yeah, so I got a job with Target. I worked there for a couple of years, and then I had to for well, more than a couple of years, and then after that I had to go away abroad for various reasons. I spent several years abroad, then I came back. I had kids, uh, so I was waiting for my kids to grow up, etc. And and I continued writing for children, but I hadn't yet written books for children. And then out of the blue, in two thousand eight. Right, my editor, who had been my editor in Target, saw my story in some children's magazine and said, "Hey, I've just taken over as a publisher, as a director of children's books, editor of children's books in a new company called in a new publishing house called Heshek. And uh, remember me, and will you please write for me?" So, see, Target came back full circle, and she said, "Why don't you write a series?" for me and i said really you have the confidence and she said yes i have seen your work and i do have the confidence and that's how my dream series this is something i've always wanted to write a fantasy novel with indian characters or sort of indian references and indian monsters and you know bring in like an indian scene into fantasy and that was tara knots it became an eight part series i mean who would have thought that i would be writing an eight part series on this but i did uh and now they continue to be popular so taranats was just amazing to write it was my dream i had thought about it since i was so young that i want to write a truly indian series using indian characters and indian sort of thought indian philosophy into the because what is indian philosophy say essentially one main thing you know it's very common that most books will have one the good guy and the bad guy and the conflict between the good guy and the bad guy and the underrated hero so this is a common theme across fantasy novels but what is different from a in a western way of looking at it and in an indian way of looking at the same thing in indian thought there is no if you look at whether you look at devas and asuras or you look at any kind of villains in mythology basically what it says is there are no truly good guys 100% good and there are no truly bad guys there are no 100% bad guys there is no such thing as evil you know that as irredeemably evil no good guys slip up they make mistakes when the devas get too arrogant they are cursed right and asuras who are supposed to be the arrogant misguided kind of people they are not all bad some of them are amazing they are they are very pious they are very scholarly only they they are almost exactly like the only thing that differentiates the two is the choices they make they they was usually end up making good choices which is good for everybody for the welfare of the world and not very selfish choices and the asuras end up making selfish choices or they get too arrogant they get too vain they think they are bigger than god himself and then they need to be punished but when asuras do good things they are given boons as well there are enough stories of asuras getting boons so that is the the main difference and that's what i wanted to bring out in my books that everybody has shades of gray everybody has if you if you have read taranots in the in the taranots the main hero and the villain are twins 
okay? The hero is called Shunya and the villain is called Shah Pazur, but they're actually twin brothers. They're exactly the same. They're equally accomplished, equally brave, equally intelligent, equally courageous. They just make different decisions when it comes to making a decision. And I wanted to tell kids that that's what it is. You have Shunya inside you and Shah Pazur, both of them live inside you. Who you become decides on who you choose to be. So you create your own destiny. So that is another life lesson which I had learned, which I put into my books. And I'm amazed at the number of kids who have got that lesson out of that book. And they come and tell me, uh, Auntie, that was very nice that no, none of us is really bad. And it's, it's really in our hands to choose whether we want to be good or bad. Nobody makes our destiny for us. We can choose to create the destiny we want by making good choices. And it is a choice. Nobody is compelling you to do anything. You have to decide that these are the options and I choose to do this. And whatever you choose, the consequences of that you have to face and that you will become that. The more you choose a particular thing, you will become that. So be very careful. Choose mindfully. Whatever course of action you want to take, choose it mindfully because that will determine who you are. These small, 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 small choices, everyday choices that you think are not important actually add up and make you the person that you become. So be very mindful. So Taranauts taught me that. And uh, then after that, uh, Taranauts finished. And then I was like, okay, now what I'm totally fictioned out. I have written eight books of fiction. I have nothing more fiction in my head. I have wrung out all my creativity. Now what do I do? What do I do? And then I said to myself, hmm. So I missed out telling you one part of my journey growing up. I studied to be an engineer. Even though I was so clear from when I was very young that I wanted to be a writer. My parents, especially my mom, she wanted me to be somebody with a professional degree who could stand on her own feet financially and never have to depend on anybody else. So she said, no, you're smart enough to do an engineering degree, please finish it. And then you can go and do whatever you like. And I kicked and screamed and protested and whined and complained throughout my four years of engineering, but I did finish with a distinction, so I did well because that was something that was drilled into me, that if you take up anything, whether you hate it or love it, doesn't matter, you have to do well. You have to put in the best effort. So I finished my degree. I gave her the degree certificate. I said, you can put it in your puja room and you can do puja to it. I'm off. I'm going to be a writer now, right? But now when I had finished Taranauts and I was wondering what to do next, where was my comfort zone? Science, because I had studied it for so many years and at such a high level that I said, hmm, since I don't know what to write about, and I find that a lot of children struggle with understanding scientific concepts, maybe I can write about science in a fun way for them. And then I wrote a book, which I don't have a copy of right here with me, but it's called, uh, What If the Earth Stopped Spinning and 24 Other Mysteries of Science. And I had so much fun writing it. And I kid you not, for the first time in my life, I actually understood some of those concepts that I was writing about, stuff that I should have understood and, uh, in eighth grade. I only understood at, I won't tell you what age, but very much later in life when I was writing a book for kids about it. And that was because there was no pressure of any exam. I could, and I had the whole internet at my disposal. I could do as much research. I could see all the fun videos about various scientific concepts. And then putting my own science background and all of this together, I was able, to, and my uh, skills as a writer or a storyteller, I was able to put it across in a fun way. And that taught me something else. So my second life lesson from writing, or maybe now it's I'm talking about third, I don't know, was that uh, no experience in life is wasted. So stop thinking about uh, things that happen to you as good and bad or a successful or a, or a big failure or a happy experience or a sad experience. Don't think of them like that because that will only make you miserable and unhappy. So you say, you just think of everything as an experience. It's an experience, I'm going through it and I'm not gonna feel very ecstatic about, oh my God, this is exactly what I wanted my whole life because sometimes you could, you could want and want. it's not exactly how I thought it would be and I'm not enjoying it so, so much. So that could happen. So there could be disappointment like that or there could be, oh my God, this is horrible. This is not, this is not what I wanted at all. I wanted other things. So I'm going to be determined not to enjoy this and I'm just going to complain about it. And I, 
am not going to because suppose I had said that I hate engineering and you put me into it just you forced me to and I'm just going to fail every subject to teach you a lesson who would have learned the lesson who would it have hurt my parents or me me clearly so at least I finished that and because of my conditioning you know of a very obedient kind of girl I just had to do it properly but and but I hated it and I blamed my parents for a long time for pushing me into it but when it came to now writing this book and suddenly everything was so much easier for me because of my science background to understand and to convey it to kids I was like you know we have to stop thinking of experiences as good bad failure success once you take out that tag once you stop thinking in binaries this versus that and just say it's an experience and it will give me something somehow i would have changed even if it was an unhappy experience i now know what i do not like and therefore i can try and stay away from it right so that was one thing i learned then after that i was again please tell me when i have like 10 minutes left or 5 minutes left because i can just go on so moderators please and then i'll hurry up when i have to finish and okay and then um, then i was like once again i was at a loose end and saying what i i just wanted to write i always wanted to write but what do i write about now i have written about um, stuff now what i had no ideas in my head at all and then my editor said hey i have this great idea for you and i'm like then this editor is the same one who was my editor in target who was my editor with tara not so i trusted her completely okay so i said okay tell me tell me i'm very excited patsala her name is so i said patsala tell me tell me what would you like me to write about you have a great idea for me tell me and she said why don't you write yes 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 tell me tell me why don't you write the bhagavad gita for children and i was like why the bhagavad gita and my sort of jaw fell off to the floor and my eyes rolled out and i was like are you nuts like you know the bhagavad gita is for old people first of all second of all and most importantly of all i haven't read the entire text in my entire life not even once third of all it seems like the most boring intimidating book and why would i want to torture children with this they already have enough horrible stuff to study as part of exams and their regular studies why would I, you know my job as a writer is to provide them entertainment fun and escape from their daily routine and daily drudgery of subjects that they have to learn which is good for them i have no problem about against formal education at all i love it you know i have benefited so amazingly from it so you should do so but but when you're a child it doesn't seem like all that exciting you know school subjects so i said no 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 i am not writing geetha for children and all and she said okay you know she said don't give up like don't say like don't come with all these preconceived notions in your head you say you haven't read the text the text at all why don't you just go read it and then after that if you tell me you hate it then i i won't bother you but i kept saying something six months i resisted and then she totally gave up and said and she threw me a challenge and i can't resist this challenges so she said okay here's a challenge go away and read the text once for i give you a month give it your best shot go in with an open in mind see if if you if it's really such a terrible book if it's so difficult to understand if it's uh, definitely things like that then once you have read it and tell me that i will believe you and if you say that i will promise to let you off the hook i won't ask you to write again write this book again so i said okay Throw me a challenge. I went anyone under sixty-five. So I went away and I began to read. I went to an aunt who sort of knew it well and who was a very fun aunt anyway. And she gave me a couple of books to read, commentaries, and she gave me her text, her uh, copy of the Bhagavad Gita. And she said, "Okay, you read it." And then she gave me a little perspective, this, that. She said, "And you know that uh, uh, Krishna and Arjuna are best friends, right?" And I said, "What? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know that Arjuna and Krishna were best friends." I thought Krishna was a god. Narjuna was like always sitting like this, kneeling in the chariot. Whenever you see a Bhagavad Gita, Gita Upadesh, anything, it's like that. So I said, no, no, I didn't realize they were friends. And she said, what do you mean? They were best friends. And I said, hmm. Now that puts a new complexion on this whole Gita thing. So basically, the Bhagavad Gita is a conversation between two best friends. Okay, I think I can write about that for children if that conversation is worth anything. That is, but otherwise, it's just a conversation between two best friends. Huh? That sounds like something I could relate to ch- children. And then. 
I began to read it. And then one month later, my editor called very hesitantly, okay, so have you been reading? And what do you think? Do you still hate it? Uh, and I'm like, what do you mean? It's the best thing in the, it's such a wonderful text. Everybody should read it. Every child should know it. I wish I had read it as in my childhood. What a different life I would have had. You know, I would have saved myself so much pain. I would have approached life in such a different manner. It's really not, it's not religious at all. There's nothing religious about it. There's nothing patriarchal. There's nothing casteist, casteist about it. It's just the, it's just a book of wisdom that can apply to anybody of any religion, of any time, of any age, of any race, of any culture. And it is really, I think the oldest self-help book in the world. So she said, okay, calm down. I thought you were like so dead against it. Now what happened? And I'm like, mm, yes, that's true. I shall eat humble pie. And yes, you were right. It's a great book. I would love to do this and I would love to write about it for children. And then I wrote the book and it was such a beautiful experience. It completely transformed me on many levels. Uh, it was truly a spiritual experience. But when the book finally came out, I was like sitting in my room under the table and saying, oh my God, people are going to th start throwing stones at my house now because, you know, because Rick Riordan, who writes the Percy Jackson books and so many other books, Cain Chronicles and all that. He writes about God too. Uh, he writes about, uh, um, you know, Greek gods and mythology, but he can write whatever he likes about those gods because they are not worshipped anymore. They're not living gods. So he can write that they live on top of Empire State Building, whatever he wants, he can write. But in, in, in India, the Gita is a living, breathing text, which is still revered 2,500 years after it was first composed. So you have to be very careful and you have to be very respectful. And I was like, oh my God, please. And what happened was that it turned out to be a huge success. People loved it, took it to their hearts and surprised me completely. And what I learned from that experience is that nothing, nothing in the world, no subject is boring or annoying or difficult. If you go, if you approach it with an open mind, ready with a curious uh, instinct, and say, it can't be boring. You know, I'm going to try and understand this. Everything is wonderful in this world. Every subject is interesting. If you have a good teacher, if you go with the right uh, attitude as a student, you know, if you open yourself, you, there may be subjects that you say, maybe I'm not good at this. That might happen, but that's not because subject is boring or anything. Maybe you have an aptitude more for something else, but nothing is unconquerable uh, if you go with the right attitude. So that was another learning and then the, then that, that's why I went on to write this book on economics without knowing anything about economics because I said that's what the Gita has taught me I can go into any new subject with an open mind wonderful so yeah so this these are my various learnings I think I've run out of time so if you have questions do ask me and uh, I will try and answer okay what inspired you to create the world of Tharanauts one sec let me see it uh, where's the chat? Okay. Uh, what inspired you to create the world of Taranauts? How did you get the idea for it? Okay. So I think I have, yeah. Okay, fine. I'll read the entire question out. Uh, what inspired you to create the world of Taranauts? How did you get the idea for it? Characters particularly. Do you intend to bring out more books in this series in the future? Right. So uh, I like I, I give you some of the background, mythology, my own interest in mythology, my understanding of uh, my, my desire to write Indian books for Indian children and all that. But Tara notes particularly, uh, when uh, uh, Setika uh, introduced me, she talked about how I also lead history and heritage walks and I'm like a history buff. I run a company called Bangalore Walks. And I used to take children and I still do to a temple in Karnataka, which is a how, almost 900 year old temple. And you know, one of the first times I went there and someone, a regular guide was explaining things to me in the temple. I was fascinated by a compass, by a very Indian compass in the ceiling of the temple, in the stone ceiling. And what was amazing about that compass is there is no East, West, there's no W and E or even the Hindi or Sanskrit, uh, Devanagari or Kannada uh, script to tell you which is East and West. There are only eight gods carved in eight cardinal directions. And depending on which god that is, you know which direction that is. And 
that sort of, I said, wow, the guardians of the eight directions, that would be a nice thing for a book sometime based on Indian stuff. And then, so that's how the world of that, that's how Mithya began to come into being, that there were eight worlds and there were guardians of, or kings or queen Marazas and Maranis of these eight worlds. And then the other inspiration for Taranauts was Salman Rushdie, that great, great Indian writer, Salman Rushdie, who wrote this one, he's written a couple of children's books too, or books for children, called, one of my, one of my favorites, favorite books of all time is his book called Harun and the Sea of Stories. And he uses Indian words so beautifully. And I was like, mm, I need to do that. And that's how the characters, how did they come? Uh, Zwala, Zarpa, and Tufan. So Zwala, if you think about it, Zwala, anything with a Z sounds like a cool name. It's not, uh, you, Zwala, you don't know anybody called Zwala from any country, so it's an unusual name. So it feels all fictional. But if you keep saying Zwala, Zwala again, and try to write it in Hindi particularly, what does it actually become? Jwala. And, that, and that's why Zwala's spirit parent is fire. And if you say Zarpa, and you keep thinking Zarpa, Zarpa, what could it be? What else could it be? You get Sarpa, Sarpa. And that's why her spirit parent is Shesha, the great serpent. And Tufan, of course, is Tufan. But I'm always amused by a lot of children who read his name as Tuffin. Because it's T-U-F-A and it could be Tuffin. And then they don't get the, they, obviously, the connection to this is not, is very subtle. So I've had a lot of parents and adults read the books and say, oh my God, I caught that reference. I caught that. That is Indian. That is Indian. That was India when we were growing up. You know, so though that was my inspiration, actually, for characters. And would I like to do more with these characters. I would love to do more with these characters. Maybe someday. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. What else? Questions. Uh, how do you manage writings for such diverse genres, fiction, and even translation? Uh, I think my attention span is very small. So I keep needing to do different things. Curiosity is great. Attention span is uh, small. And time is very short. So within the time I have, I try to do as much as many different things as possible because I like to challenge myself. I I don't particularly enjoy doing this something I have done once, doing it again with different characters or doing the same thing again with a different approach um, is not as exciting to me as as tackling something entirely else. But you know, the one of the life lessons that I wanted to tell you about, but I never got uh, got around to it is that as more and more I write about different subjects, which I start with thinking, my God, there can be nothing close, as far away from the Gita as economics. And that's why I wrote uh, economics after the Gita. And then I find so many parallels about, you know, what is economics really about? It's about psychology. It's about greed. It's about human selfishness. And then there are ways and how to harness that selfishness for the greater good people want to do things for themselves if you tell them that you know do this it will it will be good for you but also it will be good for the world you don't have to even tell them that it's also good for the world you have to plan things as an economist in such a way that they will believe it's good for them and do it but actually it's good for everybody so innate human selfishness all these things are actually connected so the gita sort of flows into the what i learned while writing the gita helped me, actually helped me write my book on economics. So it's very funny, but it's uh, great, it's great fun uh, to realize this, that actually there are, nothing is very different from anything else. We are all connected and all the subjects are connected. And the more you get into different subjects, you realize how many parallels there are. Okay, in sm smaller towns, heritage education is not all that developed. Could you suggest ways in which I as a parent could discover cultural landmark? So, so this is a parent asking, and I think, the internet is your best friend. I mean, earlier it used to be difficult, you know, because India is notorious for not marking out its heritage sites well of providing brochures, of making it an experience for the tourists. We have so much rich in terms of heritage that we can't be bothered. You know, it's like, yeah, it's there. Yeah, nobody knows. It's, it's just, it's there. You know, we don't know. But now with the internet and with extremely interested and curious tourists going to all these spots and then putting stuff up on their blogs, on the web and photos and uh, information about what times it is open, 
who where to stay all these things it's very easy actually so if you just do a sweep of the internet uh, wherever you live places around my city that are good for weekend trips or something like that you will unearth something for sure and using that as a base so there will be some information in that blog about some king or about some period in history then you can go back to the internet and look look up more and more and gather fit pieces together from various things and then go and see it you know it's it's so much easier today than it used to be when we were young so i i, I think just make the web your best friend and it's a great resource uh you should just do it you know and children really you know i really the other thing i feel about history and culture is that we don't teach it very well in our schools and because somehow we we know we know so much more about the world war and so many other things or even about the indian freedom struggle but we don't know what happened with the indian freedom struggle in our town or somewhere around us once we do that once we introduce that to our children and to ourselves everything becomes so contextualized you know you feel oh my my town was part of this big big, big movement as well it doesn't become some isolated thing that happened somewhere and that's how you really feel that you are part of this big story that is india that is free india so uh, i think history should be taught starting from the very local super local hyper local and then going outwards from there so even if the textbooks don't cover it i think as parents we should definitely teach our children the history of our neighborhoods our towns our villages wherever we live even our own neighborhood and then going further from there to give them a real sense of living history um okay then do you have a recommended list of books on hmm, that we children could read not for children really i mean there are i mean again i'll send you a reply i can't think of too many off the top of my head but if i think a, a little bit i'll be able to come up with a few and i will share it uh with, on a mail that your that shraddha can then share with all of you mm we share a little, little about your forthcoming books actually right now i am in a blank phase so i'm just uh, uh i'm just i'm just letting it be for now uh i had always planned to take a little break from writing and this was the year that i had planned to take it in because you know even writers any creative person needs some rejuvenation time to come up and just to think i want to catch up on my own reading because i've been writing a lot these last 10 years 11 years so just now i have nothing some few ideas are boiling simmering away on little pots in my in little pots in my head but i'm not sure yet what i'm going to be writing about uh so that's the answer to that and any advice for aspiring writers ah this is my favorite question because everybody asks me this and i always have only two rules for aspiring writers the first one is read 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 and the second one is write 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 and the third one two and a half rule number two and a half is don't at all worry or think or aspire to be published yet that is not the destination right the destination the true goal should be to find your own voice and let me make, make it a confident voice but i so when you read what happens is you get points of view uh, because for a writer see being able to see many different points of view on the same subject is very is a very very important skill to 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 have imagination is important and imagination and empathy so to be able to feel what someone else is feeling not a character in your book but even your friends and uh, and how do you get get to understand how to feel empathy and all that part of it is natural but part of it can be learned by reading a lot of books then you feel empathy for say a uh, uh, dalit character in a book perhaps like you know somebody who has been oppressed you feel for them then you will hear about some other privileged character talking about his problems or her problems say so, yeah that's also true that's also a point of view he also from his point of view he is oppressed from her point of view she is oppressed so you get to see a bunch of different stories so it's important to fill your head with perspectives of all, all different kinds and then all that to be said is your point of view uh, on something that you want to convey so 
that can only come with practice of writing. So you have to be, you have to do the work. Unfortunately, there's no shortcut. And one of the other important life lessons I've learned as a writer is, it's all very well to say, oh, it's a creative process. And when the muse strikes, when inspiration strikes, I sit down and write, I bang away at the computer for like 10 days and an entire fabulous, deathless prose of a novel is created. It's not like that. Unfortunately, writing or any creative endeavor, maybe some very genius people can do that. But for most of us, writing is a daily drudgery. You have to sit in front of your computer or your notebook or whatever every single day, day after day for a certain number of hours. Some days, 10,000 words will come up. Some days, five. But you can't give up. You can't say, ah, it's not happening and go away. And I'll try after 10 days. No, every single day you have to be there. You have to show up. You have to be present and you have to work. So discipline is very important for a writer. So those are my recommendations. Um, if you were given the chance to spend one third of the day with an author, one third with, oh my God, and one third day with mythological character, my good, yes, bit much, hey, hey, bit much, yes, yes, <laughs> bit much. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. I think um, if I had to spend a day with half a day, one third, one third of a day with an author, I think it would be Salman Rushdie. I just admire that man's mind. Uh, uh, the depth and breadth of his knowledge of information and the page favorite author is very scary also. I wouldn't know what to speak to him if I met him. I just want to sit at his feet and let him talk for one third of a day. Uh, a fictional character I don't know so many but perhaps one of my most favorite characters from one of my most favorite books is this lawyer Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee an American book one of my most favorite books of all time and, and he's such a wonderful character uh, such a good dad uh, such a warrior for justice and fairness and such a nice man overall that I think I'd like to spend one third of the day with him. Just fly on the wall as he deals with his kids and goes about his business. I just want to see what he does in a day. So that's one third. And mythological character. Uh, I don't know. Draupadi, maybe. I'd really love to ask her what her life was like because not many people write about what her life must have been like with these uh, five guys. So that might be an interesting person to meet. Okay, next. Uh, wait, okay. How do I as a 15 year old determine what exactly is my passion? Oh yeah, it's a tough one. That's a difficult uh, one. I'm glad that you're interested in many things that's wonderful because a lot of kids say I'm, I'm not interested in, in anything that's a far different far more that's a far worse problem to have if you're interested in many things just go with the flow uh but, but there are a couple of things you're more interested in than other things give those pursuits a real solid good Put all your effort and mind into that and see uh, maybe two, two months, three months after giving it what a of carry. Give for instance, like the text give that text and say, okay, give it what? Then I'll know that best shot. And I decided mindfully that this is not, maybe that I Hello? So, hello, can you hear me? Okay. So, that kind of thing. Uh, and then... I think that might be a good way. To, I lost the questions, I think. Anyway, that I, I think Shraddha will put the question 
things on again but uh, that's a good way to eliminate because if you're too distracted and too scattered you'll never know and you'll always feel very confused and frustrated that i don't know what i want but if you if you focus on one thing that you think you like perhaps over everything else and you feel that mm, this is not happening i don't think so then you can eliminate it you know then you don't have to think about it again and it won't be can now you see the thing the difference is also that when i was growing up we had very few options real options so it was easier to choose actually there is a there's a thing called the tyranny of choice too much choice just makes you more confused so unfortunate so the thing is you think that cho- great choice many options is a wonderful thing it seems from side it feels as if if there were only two three options right of them because there was no other choice and then as you were doing it you would do it well and you would be happy with the choice you made because the choice that you don't know what to do so it's a problem of for this generation that you have to figure out how to deal with uh okay which is my latest book this is my latest book sorry this is my latest book for children i call from leeches to slug glue if i have explosive ideas that made and are making modern medicine and when i wrote it last year it came out in september 2019 and i started writing it perhaps in february or march 2019 uh and when i said to my editor that I'm, i want to write a book about medicine because i got interested in ayurveda when i was writing the vedas and upanishads for children and i discovered that the atharva veda is actually the inspiration for ayurveda so i got interested in that and i was also interested in modern medicine because my sister is a doctor and there are 15 doctors within my immediate family when i said i'm right i want to write a book on medicine she looked at me as if i'd gone crazy she's like what why would children be interested in the book on medicine who cares right i mean wouldn't they aren't there more exciting topics to write about perhaps there were but i was at pains to tell her that actually medicine is a very very exciting to be topic because what can be more exciting than your own health you know and to understand how the body works and also the journey of how we have arrived at the 21st century uh knowing i mean we 100 and just to give you a little taste if you lived 150 180 years ago and you were ill nobody in the world knew that germs cause disease they would probably put a lot of leeches on you to suck out your bad blood most people thought disease was either a divine curse or demonic possession or something like that and just about just last year i over the past few years it's like as if doctors are terrible people doctors have have you know such a bad reputation they have nowadays in the public uh, um, mind that they are money making people they will send you for all kinds of tests they get a cut from the lab they don't they no daddy they have no dedication all this kind of thing and i was very hurt about that because i know how hard the people in my family work and how how dedicated they are to make people feel better and i felt so bad that the doctors in general are getting such a bad reputation hospitals are thought of as terrible places they go they you go in there you come out bankrupt they treat you badly all that and western medicine was being made out to be some kind of monster like you know they just give you chemicals to put in your body they just they, the medicines actually destroy your body big pharma st- there is some truth in all of these allegations but i felt that people were forgetting and particularly children were forgetting and perhaps did not even know that if you lived 150 years ago there would be very little chance that you would go into a hospital and get better and come out because there was no anesthesia surgery was done without anesthesia imagine that if you had any mental illness even something like depression that you were not fit, fitting into the society they would probably drill a hole in your skull to let out the evil spirit and they would probably take you away and lock you up for life and uh, nobody knew that or you would some plague would come and everybody would die like thousands of people right just like that and all that was figured out with vaccinations and all and today we have no such fear that if we go into a hospital to get our tonsils removed we will never come out of there alive we don't have such fear and still we had become such terrible we had we had began to hate medicine and western medicine and doctors so much that i felt we were throwing the baby out with the bath water and i felt children should come to know all the sacrifices dedication all that went of so many amazing men and women 
all the work they have done has given us this chance to live longer, more disease-free and more pain-free lives in the 21st century. And that's why I wrote this book and look what happened. This came out in September 2019 and December 2019, this pandemic hits the world. And suddenly doctors and healthcare workers are back to being the heroes that they really are. And everyone's like, my God, we can't do without these guys. Now everyone's depending on Western medicine to find a vaccine, right? So it was a funny thing that happened. Yeah, now the next question was, oh, with uh, Milin. Yeah, that was a fun book to do. So that was, that was very strange also how it happened. So when the Rio, Olymp Rio Olympics were going on, I'm also very interested in sport and particularly athletics and uh, particularly Indian sports women. That's my area of true passion. And people were putting up stuff in the first couple of days of the Olympics. Like, I don't know why so many Indians go to the Olympics. Anyway, we're not going to win anything. Our sportsmen never come back at the name. Some horrible stuff like that. And I was very upset. And I said, you know, I need to put some stuff in my on my Facebook page. I want to put up stories of our, our athletes who are doing such amazing stuff. They are such, you know, they're at such a high level and may, just winning the gold, silver or bronze doesn't, doesn't mean that only if you win that you're great because just qualify for the Olympics, qualify for the Olympics and you're able to go there. Physical athlete, like, you know, accomplishment, your physical accomplishments are amazing and mental because the sport is so much about mental strength, even more than physical strength. So I began to put out these stories of Indian sportswomen who were taking part that day. And I said, and Rio, the time difference was such that if I put up a story on Facebook in the morning, I would say at 3.15, watch her on the tracks. I would give the backstory of how she became an athlete, all the obstacles she had to face on the way, all that. And then put, and these stories became really, really popular. They got viral. They got shared hundreds and hundreds of times. And people began to look forward to these stories. It was only 15 days. The Olympics was only 15 days. But I, I really wanted these stories to go out and I put it. And then suddenly, on the 4th or 5th day that I was putting out these stories, I got a message uh, from somebody called Milin Soman on the, he commented on my Facebook post saying, I got a friend request and saying, and uh, my comment saying, oh my God, you write so well. And I was like, wait a minute, Milin Soman, the at Milin Soman, because, you know, when I was growing up, he was an icon, like supermodel. So I went and I looked him up on the Facebook and it was him. So I said, oh my God, million someone sent me a friend request. But I thought that was all it was. But one year later, when he wanted to write his memoir, he told his publisher, uh, you know, I want to write it, but I, I'm not a writer. And I would like this. He was putting up some posts on Facebook and I want her to write it. So that, that gives me another... No, I lesson to share with you that just do think about looking for some reward, particular outcome out of it, because you can't eat the outcomes, maybe. How I would have never imagined that a book with Millen Soman would be the result of my putting out some Facebook posts about Indian athletes that I was passionate about. Right? So whatever you do, do it with food. Zero percent expectation. That's the recipe for happiness. Just focus on your effort. Do not worry about the result. Mainly because you cannot control the result because the world, so many things are going on, so many variables. You can't say, I'm studying really hard because I want to come first. That's a silly way to think of it because then you're putting an expectation for a particular outcome. <coughs> also, it's very toxic to say, I'm studying so hard because I want to come first. Because that means you are actually saying, you're also saying that anybody else who studies as hard as I or even harder than I should only come second, third or fourth. That's not a nice thought to put out into the world, right? And mainly, you cannot control the outcome. That particular day, maybe that other person has a better day. You forget something, the teacher who corrects it is in a bad mood. So many things can happen. So you, the, out, the, the outcome is not in your hands at all. What is in your hands? What you can control 100%, 200% is your effort. So just focus on that. Give everything you do the best you can. Best effort, best love, best energy, best focus, best dedication. And that's all. That is all that matters. You will always feel happy whatever the outcome is. And sometimes you cannot even predict what the outcome may be. So yeah, he turned out to be a wonderful, wonderful person. 
and uh, it was a great great uh, time chatting with him he's like you know we connected on so many levels he's very philosophical and very grounded and so keen on physical fitness and he is amazing so it was a very nice experience <clears throat> anything else uh, as a parent who's not a reader what's the best sort of books to introduce to children hmm actually there are i mean really just go with your uh, gut with your instinct just go into bookstores more even if you're not a reader children's books don't require you to be a reader you can just flip through and see what the stories are whatever appeals to you bring it home um and let your take your definitely involve your child in the shopping let him or her also mess around in the bookstore pick out something that appeals to him or her and uh don't be the kind of parent who says no no that looks like a silly book let's not buy this let's buy this no let the child buy what he or she is attracted to you buy what you feel is important for the child and read both books with the child you may not be a reader but definitely because up there are so many benefits of that not just the reading itself but the bond you build the memories you build with your children so all the best uh, i'm sure you can find something and there are many groups on facebook you know for reading recommendations for young children so you can probably look for those as well and it will be very useful as well so i hope you guys got something out of this uh hope you enjoyed this whole interaction mm, i will send some recommendations on good indian children's books for mythology and uh, all that thank you so much Thank you.